in Revelation 12, 10, we read, Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives even to death. I believe there's no verse more fitting um, for the man that we're going to be studying today um, than this verse here in Revelation. And uh, our study today is going to be on William Tyndall. Uh, this is one of um, the most important, if not the most important, reformers of the English Reformation, and he's also one of my personal favorites. Um, <clears throat> Today, many don't put him at the same level as Luther, Calvin, or Knox, but uh, he is the reason that uh, we have the Bible in English and one of the driving forces that brought England out of the um, curse of Catholicism. Uh, before we begin the life of Tyndall, I want to give some background to some of the characters and times that were going on. Um, you could probably put a study in everything that was going on in England and Europe during this time period by itself, but since we don't have time, uh, I'm going to give some quick highlights. Uh, at this time, Henry VIII was ruling over uh, England and was married to Catherine of Aragon um, in 1509, the daughter of Ferdinand, King of Spain. Um, there was some controversy to this marriage uh, as Catherine was the widow of Henry's brother who died in 1505 at the age of 15. Uh, the Catholic Church traditionally took the stance that um, marriage was like this was to be prohibited based on Leviticus 18.16, which reads, You shall not uncover the nakedness of your brother's wife make this uh, marriage acceptable within the Catholic Church, uh, Henry needed to have a papal dispensation. And as long as the Catholic's purse was taken care of, typically um, there was no problem getting one. Uh, <clears throat> in the year 1511, Pope Julius II was um, ruling and he formed a holy league with the German Emperor Maximilian and um, Spanish King uh, Ferdinand to counter the growing power of Louis XII in France. Henry at this time was young and he was highly offended that he wasn't invited to be a part of this club and uh, to try to show his worth he offered to flex his war muscles by invading the French in the spring of 1512. Uh, this army wasn't much to be proud of, they were few in numbers, they were ill-trained and um, just like their king, their arrogance of that they could be the victors due to their English heritage uh, uh, led them to a disastrous defeat as Louis XII proved to be too much. And uh, Henry's father-in-law, the king of Spain, failed to provide the backup that uh, he promised. Uh, a year later, to kind of heal his uh, hurt pride, Henry reinvaded the city of Calais in France with a force of 30 to 40,000 men. Although this was a success and uh, they took two French cities, uh, the French, causing the French armies to retreat, the burden of this war was extremely costly as uh, inflation rose and people were taxed and the colonies of England were taxed double. One of the key members to success, someone that we'll uh, be referencing here is frequently throughout this study, was a man by Thomas Wolsey. Uh, Wolsey played a big part in the victory of uh, 1513 as he uh, was able to uh, manage to supply and keep the army well stocked throughout uh, this war. He went on to negotiate peace between the two nations and was eventually placed as Lord Chancellor, the highest position in England, uh, right after the king. Uh, one other character that I want to quickly mention is the, um, that was influential in England towards the end of Tyndall's life was Thomas More. He was a philosopher and a statesman and eventually placed as Lord Chancellor when Wolsey failed to convince the Pope to annul Henry's marriage to Catherine. More opposed the Reformation, writing heavily against Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin, and of course Tyndall. And he was eventually executed by Henry for failing to recognize the King of England as the supreme head of the church and failed to support the annulment of Catherine. One of his best known works that um, was released in 1516 was Utopia. Some consider him to be the first utopian socialist and was highly influential in um, some of the socialistic ideas of the Anabaptists and early Marxists. Uh, Marxist theories, theorists of modern times consider his ideas too simplistic and um, don't give him much respect today. Uh, he is considered also by some the last great Catholic of England, so I think those two characteristics can tell you all you need to know about this man. Um, so some of Tyndall's life is difficult to put together. Uh, we don't know much about his childhood. All, no historian can really um, make out what his childhood looked like. And because he was on the run and tried to stay hidden from England and um, the Catholic Church, there's some periods of time in his life that we just don't know about. 
It is believed Tyndall was born somewhere around 1494 and died in 1536. He was born in uh, Gloucestershire, and by the year 1508, Tyndall began his studies at Oxford. Uh, eventually, he would finish at Cambridge, where most of um, the, his influence would come from. Uh, in England at this time, one would spend about five years studying for their bachelor. Uh, you would learn things such as geometry, philosophy, astronomy, things of that nature. And then uh, after that, you would spend three years going after your master's. Once you attained your master's, you were then allowed to study scriptures after you were taught how to think. Uh, this would later greatly disturb Tyndall, and at this time it was greatly disturbing Erasmus, who wrote heavily against this. Erasmus also said that uh, the um, time that they were spent uh, in scriptures were lectures debating blasphemous heresies such as could God have made the universe better can the Pope command angels is the Pope more merciful than Christ and other such nonsense uh, this was used, the useless kind of theology that Tyndall would have been uh, receiving at Oxford um, but as I said like before his greatest influence would be in Cambridge um, in the year 1511 uh, Erasmus left Oxford and uh, went to uh, Cambridge where he started teaching Greek and compiling a Greek New Testament. Uh, he hated his time here in Oxford and Cambridge, uh, specifically because at the time Henry's War was going on and when inflation rose up, it made his manuscripts very difficult for students to purchase and um, uh, get some of his work out. He was also having to deal with uh, other scholastic uh, professors calling his Greek New Testament work arch heresy. Uh, Erasmus ended up leaving Cambridge in 1519 before Tyndall transferred from Oxford to Cambridge, but not before he would leave a huge impact on the school. Uh, Cambridge was definitely more, one of the more Protestant of the two schools there in England, uh, with people such as Ridley, Cramner, Billney, Barnes, Coverdale, and others attending. And the Protestant learnings found at this school would heavily influence uh, Tyndall throughout his life. His desire to transfer, however, was specifically for Erasmus' Greek New Testament and his passion for new languages. Uh, he loved listening to debates and writings of Erasmus, but it was his Greek New Testament that he spent uh, just about all his time and money uh, trying to study. Uh, he, um, although we don't know much about his time at Cambridge, we do know that uh, him and a lot of the students would spend time uh, studying and debating different church doctrines. And um, one Bishop at the time wrote uh, Wolsey saying that the university had been infected with Lutheranism. Uh, soon Tyndall realized that he must leave Cambridge, but it wasn't due to the opposition that was um, being faced against the Lutheran ideas that were growing in Cambridge, but um, he knew that it would have to be more than talk. And at this time, um, uh, the people he was surrounding himself were, they were they could easily get into a battle of words, but uh, he knew that the battle that was ahead of him was much farther than words. Uh, he knew that he couldn't surround himself with people that would compromise or recant, but rather um, should spend time thinking, praying, and study the Greek New Testament for himself. So in 1521, um, we come and uh, Tyndall has left Cambridge, and he goes to a, a place called the Sodbury Manor, where he met his new employers, Sir John and Lady Walsh. Um, these were very important figures here in this county. Uh, he would take employment as their tutor for Sir John's two sons, who Tyndall would teach to read, write, and count. Along with teaching the two boys, Tyndall also preached at a small church just above the manor, where he would expound the word both simply and forcefully from his Greek New Testament. In the summer of the same year, Tyndall, on warm afternoons, would climb to the top of the hill just above the manor and would observe his surroundings, and here he saw many poor pe peasants all over the village. He looked at the plowman, who at this time was the lowest of the low, and um, uh, who worked for the lord of the manor and usually worked for nothing more than just a free meal. Uh, for Tyndall, the plowman was a symbol of the hard-working, ignorant, superstitious, poor Englishman. No one cared for him, and he would never be much more than a plowman. Uh, the scholars had their Bible in Latin and their Greek New Testament, but what use was this to the plowman? How would the Greek and Latin free him of his superstition? How would the Greek and Latin speak to him of Christ's redemptive work on the cross? These questions burdened and tormented Tyndall day and night, and he came to the only solution was to put a right on the scriptures in English. Tyndall now knew what he must do, and he wasn't when he wasn't busy teaching the boys, he was either studying his Greek New Testament, preparing for the work ahead of him, or he was traveling 15 miles by foot to the town of Bristol to um, preach the gospel. 
uh, Tyndall knew the people of Bristol well, and uh, especially their preaching friars who would listen intently to the priests from Sodbury. His message was plain and scriptural, but hardly a popular for this day. I'd like to read one of the things um, that he was reported as preaching there, and it said, uh, If thou repent and believe the promises, then God's truth justify thee. That is, forgiveth thee thy sins, and sealeth thee with his Holy Spirit, and maketh thee heir of everlasting life through Christ's deservings. Now thou have true faith, so seest thou the exceeding and infinite love and mercy which God has showed thee freely in Christ. He then took it one step further, preaching directly to the Augustin, Augustinian friars, saying, God hath promised Christ's merits unto all to repent, so that whosoever repenteth is immediately heir of all Christ's merits, and beloved of God as Christ is. How then can this foul monster, speaking of the Pope, uh, be lord over Christ's merits, so that he hath power to sell that which God giveth freely? O dreamers, yea, O devils, and O venomous scorpions, what poison have ye in your tails? O pestilent leaven that so turneth the sweet bread of Christ's doctrine into bitterness of gall. The friars run in the same spirit and teach, saying, Do good deeds and redeem the pains that abide in your purgatory. These were the strong words that Tyndall uh, used and words that weren't uncommon for the fiery priest to bring day after day. This, as you can imagine, didn't sit well with the friars. Um, and Tyndall, when he would begin his long journey home, uh, would have the friars meet at their alehouses, or as Tyndall would later call them, the preaching places, uh, to plot and scheme how to silence this young priest. On, at this time, uh, the bishop chancellor would hold courts to deal with matters of the church. Two years prior, the same court met on April 4th, 1519, and a woman and six men guilty of teaching their children the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, and the Apostles' Creed in English were burned at the stake. Accordingly, Tyndall was called before this council and uh, to be examined with charges of being a heretic in logic, a heretic in divinity, and several other um, charges along the same line. The friars went on to embellish the teachings of Tyndall to things that Tyndall most certainly didn't hold to, uh, to show his attacks on Rome. The chancellor warned Tyndall of the extremes the church could take if he continued down this road um, in preaching against the Roman church. Without extracting any promises from Tyndall, the young reformer, uh, the chancellor told the young reformer that he was allowed to return to the Sodbury Manor, but to stay out of Bristol. Uh, here um, at the Sodbury Manor, the influential Sir John and Lady Walsh were known for their hospitality and uh, frequently having friars and other church dignitaries um, attend their table. Uh, many of the present-day issues were discussed here, whether it was something to do with the Catholic Church, uh, their rotating popes, the King of England, or other gossip that was going around the church um, was passed around at these uh, table at this table. These high-ranking officials of the church were insulted, however, that a priest and a tutor was allowed to sit in their presence. Sir John, however, took pride in his young tutor and secretly loved to watch a good debate. He enjoyed watching as his priest would, um, so with his superior reasoning, learning, and use of scripture, um, uh, embarrassed these men. Inevitably, Tyndall always turned it back to the Latin Vulgate, and they rarely, which they rarely opened, or the Greek New Testament they could not read. Of course, when Tyndall would step away, these charlatans would use this as an opportunity to um, slander and uh, discredit him to Sir John, usually mocking him in his Bristol days. Um, however, when these objections were brought to Tyndall, he would always bring Sir John back to Scripture. And around this time, Tyndall was working on translating Erasmus' Manual of a Christian Soldier. And he gifted this to Sir John, and uh, he noticed after he gave this gift to Sir John that uh, there was less and less dignitaries being invited to sit at the table with him. And through this, something clicked with uh, Tyndall that he knew that his job would be he was going to have to be the translator of the English Bible. Um, from there, um, there was a learned man that one day sat at his uh, the table of uh, Sir John and Lady Walsh, and uh, he was growing angry with the use of scripture that Tyndall kept bringing uh, to their debate. And in a rage, he declared, we'd be better without God's law than the Pope's. Tyndall, realizing that this was the blasphemous creed of the Roman church, in turn broke the silence that fell over the room, saying, I defy the Pope and all his laws. If God spare my life ere many years, I will cause a boy that drives the plow to know more scripture than thou dost. It was clear at this point Tyndall could no longer stay at the manor as he was too dangerous. Um, he packed his things, said goodbye to Sir John and his family, and uh, set out for London in July of 1523. Now, Tyndall had a purpose for going to London. Uh, after Le uh, Wycliffe translated the Vulgate into English, 
a law was passed prohibiting any translation of scripture without the approval of the bishop. William heard rumors that there was a bishop named Tunstall who was an academic, liberal in his ways of thinking, and was well respected by Erasmus. He couldn't have picked a worse time to arrive in London, however, because at this time Cardinal Wolsey came before Parliament to request £800,000 for one of Henry's new wars. Parliament told Wolsey to look elsewhere for the money, which the only other option at this time would have been the church. So the bishops, defensive of their pocketbook, virtually said no to everything. Tyndall did manage to set up a meeting with Tunstall, but he was quick to learn that there was another side to this man. He found that he was very cold and indifferent, and Tyndall would later write that he was a cowardice hypocrite. With the uneasy political scene, the spread of this new Lutheran literature that was going around England, and with Tunstall just arriving to his new position, he was quick to tell the younger translator no. He told him that he should go elsewhere to seek approval, and basically to leave him alone. His time in London would not completely be wasted, for by God's providence, Tyndall would be preaching in a church at the city. It was here that a wealthy cloth merchant by the name of Humphrey Monmouth heard of a scripture man preaching. Humphrey traveled three miles to hear this unknown priest, and he heard the gospel presented to him. The man took Tyndall into his home for six months, and was able to introduce him to some Germans who were controlling a port there in London called the Steel Yard. The Steel Yard had been under German control since Edward I, and was under their control until Queen Elizabeth ran them out several years later. These Germans were definitely open to reform. They pushed out writings of Luther that we know Tyndall got a hold of, and it is believed this is where Tyndall got a hold of Luther's German New Testament. It was these writings that solidified Tyndall's beliefs that he had been coming to on his own through study of scripture, and the lines of the Reformation started becoming more clear to him at this point. It is here that he started moving away from the teachings and writings of Erasmus and closer to Luther. Now, moving into the year 1524, Tyndall began realizing England was not safe to translate scriptures, nor did he have anywhere he could print them. It was at this point Tyndall broke English law, escaping the continent, to the continent of Europe without permission of the king. After his escape, the University of Wittenberg had an Englishman by the name of William Dalcidi appear on its register that all historians pretty much agree this was Tyndall under an assumed name. Now, Tyndall arrived at a challenging time, because at this time Luther was dealing with his excommunication of the church, and Wittenberg was suffering from low student attendance because of Luther's issues. Unfortunately, we do not know much about any interactions with Luther and Tyndall, while neither man recorded anything. One historian believes that this was perhaps in light of the struggles that Luther was facing, he didn't have the time to record any such conversations, and Tyndall was trying to keep such a low profile that he didn't want to leave any record of his whereabouts. We do know he stayed in Wittenberg for at least 10 months, and it's believed he also may have been under a professor of Hebrew, where he would have started learning bits and pieces of Hebrew at this time. And then 10 months after that, after his arrival, we find a writing to Monmouth to send money that he had left in England, requesting that it be transferred to him in Hamburg. One thing we should distinguish is that certain men tried to paint Tyndall, even to this day, as a follower of Luther, or in his day that he was also being accused of forming confederacy with Luther. This was far from the case. Tyndall was definitely a man of his own. He came to his convictions on his own. There were also several key doctrines that Tyndall didn't agree with Luther. Luther carried over from his Catholicism the view of transubstantiation, the idea that the bread and wine is Christ's physical body. Tyndall did not hold this position, but while Barnes, Zwingli, and Luther were publicly arguing over this doctrine, Tyndall believed that there was more serious matters to be discussing, and that their public attacks on each other was a discredit and a distraction of the Reformation that would be going on. Luther also had some interesting views of scriptures itself. He believed that the Epistle of Romans and Galatians ranked above the others. He had criticisms of the book of James and questioned whether the book of Hebrews should even be in the canon of scripture. Tyndall made sure that there were 
it was understood he did not hold to this. Um, even when he published his Bible, he made sure that uh, his writers or his readers knew that uh, he, he did not hold to this. Um, some historians even go as far to credit uh, Tyndall for protecting English, uh, England from producing some of the critics that uh, Luther offsprung in Germany in the 19th century um, due to his criticism of scriptures. In 1525, uh, Tyndall finally arrives in Worms uh, to complete his New Testament. And not long after, in the spring of 1526, his New Testament is found circulating around England. Uh, once again, by God's providence, he was preparing the way for Tyndall ahead of time. And um, in England, there was, during the winter of 1525 to 26, there was a severe illness going through, which uh, kept Tunstall out of the country uh, until the August of next year. Uh, also, at this time, Henry and Wolsey were so busy dealing with some of the dramas of uh, Henry's life that this just wasn't on their radar. Uh, moreover, a poor harvest of wheat left English, England in a near famine, and um, uh, this resulted in the men of uh, the steel yard, the Germans, uh, to have to import large amounts of grains fast. And they imported so much that uh, grain was overflowing and became cheap and plentiful. But it wasn't only grain that they were transporting in. Because they had to get it in there so fast to feed the people of England, they, um, the English weren't doing a good job of checking what was coming into their ports. And uh, they were able to import a large number of Bibles. Uh, careful to put these Bibles in safe hands, they helped spread them all over the country. They hit universities, most towns, and anyone who could read tried getting their hands on it, both rich and poor. Um, but as careful as these merchants were, it wouldn't be long until the scriptures fell into enemy hands. And by the time uh, Tunstall returned uh, with rage, he held one of Tyndall's Bibles in his hands. Um, it got so bad that uh, it was even reported that in Scotland, uh, they were finding these Bibles circulating um, around that country. Uh, having failed to stop the spread of the book, uh, the bishops uh, grew angry and devised a brilliant plan to buy up all the books that arrived, and many bishops, including uh, Tunstall, financed uh, this scheme. This helped all parties involved as Tunstall got his books burning, the merchants received their thanks, and Tyndall got the funds to begin his new edition. Uh, in 1527, uh, moving forward, Tyndall was a fugitive and an outlaw of the church. Uh, those in England were searching for him, and Europe investigating all printers, bookbinders, and merchants trying to learn of where Tyndall was located. Uh, we don't know much about this time because, uh, again, uh, Tyndall was in hiding, uh, but we assume he was in Worms up until April where a sympathetic printer uh, moved his operation to the city of Marburg, Germany, to help protect Tyndall's um, identity. Uh, currently, Tyndall wasn't Henry VIII's biggest concern as Henry VIII was trying to divorce his wife. Um, although this was a major issue of the church, the Pope remained silent. Um, this was due to the fact he didn't want to irritate England or Spain. He valued England, and at this time, Spanish soldiers were occupying uh, the Roman city. And he, uh, of course, didn't want to antagonize them. Um, by 1528, things were looking pretty bad in England. Uh, the king's divorce dragged on, and uh, Henry escalated the situation by declaring war on Charles V. And, uh, at this time, Charles V was considered the Holy uh, Roman Emperor of um, Europe. Uh, he uh, was the nephew of Catherine of Aragon, and um, he was ruling over Spain, Germany, Northern Italy, Austria, and the Low Countries made up of modern-day Netherlands, Belgium, and uh, Luxembourg. Uh, this war, this is a war that no one wanted, and although Henry never planned on acting on it, uh, it trade ceased um, because of the threat. But in all the chaos, um, England was thriving with the scriptures. And at this point, Tyndall, knowing that he was being chased by the church agents all over Europe, calmly set himself to master Hebrew and to start working on um, producing the Old Testament. Um, during this time, he also re released one of his most uh, well-known book, uh, The Obedience of the Christian Men, which spread all over England, uh, even reaching the course of Henry VIII, who recommended it as a book that all uh, leaders of nations should read. Uh, shortly after, Tyndall had the Pentateuch ready for the press and had it circulating in England by summer of 1529. This time, Tyndall also thought uh, that he should voice his opinion on the issue of Henry's divorce. He figured since everybody else gave an opinion, why shouldn't he? Um, he wrote that the passage in Leviticus 18 was being misapplied and um, that it had nothing to do with um, his brother being dead and that by those grounds he couldn't annul the marriage. 
As you can imagine, this infuriated King Henry, and um, Tyndall became an enemy of the king. In May of 1530, the king had a complete uh, change of heart, and the book he once praised uh, to be, he now called Blasphemous. He ordered that all of England had 15 days to turn over all the heretical books of Tyndall, um, giving Tunstall another great book burning. Additionally, in Europe, Charles V ordered that the Low Countries were to turn in all New Testaments of any language. Those who didn't comply were killed, men by the sword and women being buried, buried alive. Things were heating up all over Western Europe. However, this didn't slow down the persistent translator. Uh, after failed attempts to catch the elusive reformer, the king um, decided to employ a different tactic. He sent a merchant by the name of Stephen Vaughn to try to convince Tyndall uh, that he was welcome back to England. Uh, Tyndall was very wary of this man as he had no trust of the king and he proceeded cautiously. Uh, he sent a messenger out to meet Vaughn to set up a time for um, Tyndall and Vaughn to meet in a town called Antwerp. Uh, Tyndall was untrusting because in March Latimer, Bilney, and Crom were arrested. Um, he didn't really have any uh, faith in the king's um, promise of safe conduct because um, Several hundred years later, or, or prior, John Huss was burned at the stake with the safe conduct in his hand, and uh, Luther barely escaped worms with the same promise. Uh, Tyndall sent a messenger to arrange a meeting between um, himself and Vaughn. Um, uh, and during this meeting, uh, Tyndall revealed his identity. His sole purpose of the meeting was to protest the king. He informed Vaughn that he had undergone cold, thirst, hunger, and loneliness, all for the love of his countrymen, his prince, and to honor God. Vaughn pleaded with him to return home under the promise of safe passage from the king, but Tyndall declined, citing that he could just as easily undo this promise. The agent tried persuading him on two other occasions to come back to England, but Tyndall's response was that if the king allowed a scripture that could, all could read, with a translator of Henry's choosing, he would promise to quit writing and return to the realm to humbly submit before the king. Of course, this didn't happen, and Vaughn ended up returning to England empty-handed. Thomas More, at this point, was arresting um, uh, anyone who had... Um, who he considered to have new ideas or carrying heretical books and used this as an opportunity to um, um, investigate them for news of Tyndall. What's interesting in his uh, um, infamous book in, of Utopia, Moore believed that the ideal state was one that had an elected government, communal sharing, and allowance of <coughs> free ideas. Uh, funny enough, Moore stated that he would rather have a Turkish mission in the land of Christendom than to have these heretic reformers. Moore hated the reformers and hated Tyndall and his New Testament especially. On one occasion, Moore went as far um, as uh, condemning both Luther and Tyndall. For uh, Moore had a hatred for Luther for marrying uh, the ex-nun Catherine von Bora and accused the two um, for trying to bring whoredom and immorality within the priesthood. He conveniently ignored the fact that at this time uh, the bishops, friars, monks, and popes all lived openly with uh, concubines and mistresses. Uh, it enraged more to see reformers taking wives of, um, as these were men that once took vows uh, to stay celibate. Um, however, he could smear the reformers in the context of traditional Catholicism more attacked viciously. Now at this point, uh, with Vaughn returning empty-handed, empty uh, the king decided to declare Tyndall a heretic and sent word to Charles V, who was in Germany at the time, to kindly return him to England. Charles, uh, furious with how his aunt was being treated in England, uh, was in no hurry to meet any demands of Henry. Besides, at this point, Charles had just as much of an idea of where Tyndall was as Henry did. Um, so Charles blew him off by returning a message that he had no reason to believe Tyndall broke any laws of England or his lands. Uh, plus, many historians agree that um, Charles V sympathized with Tyndall uh, due to the fact that um, he was against the annulment of Catherine and Henry. Um, Things in England uh, were getting worse as persecution grew heavy. Um, by this time, Latimer was humiliated and forced to recant. Um, a man by the name of James Bainham walked into a church one Sunday morning carrying um, a Tyndall New Testament and his book, Obedience, and was killed. Um, many commoners were killed or imprisoned who were guilty of being part of the Reformers movement. Uh, and just left and right, many friends that Tyndall had uh, made over the years um, uh, were being persecuted. Uh, Tyndall cared for all of his companions, and the news of losing them was like losing a member of uh, his body. Um, he was painted at this time, and even by um, later historians, as being a callous um, uh, master using others as pawns, but this just this wasn't the case. Um, 
this caused Tyndall to go into hiding and became even more elusive and um, leads to speculations of his whereabouts until 1534. Um, at this time, Tyndall was invited to live with a family of English merchants in Antwerp by the name of Thomas Ponce. Now, Ponce was a relative of Lady Walsh of the Sodbury Manor, and the two men had previously met in the steel yard where um, Ponce was heavily influenced by the German um, Lutherans. Um, here, William found protection, was offered a stipend, and was taken care of by this family. Uh, due to his living situation, Tyndall was very thin, rather weak, and his health was pretty bad during this time. Um, this was fixed by Mrs. Ponce um, as she uh, frequently cooked and uh, took care of him uh, over the years. Uh, this was the first time in William's life that he was comfortable in um, an earthly sense, and it was this home where Tyndall would have completed his revision of the New Testament and hoped to push out a new edition after his third edition suffered uh, some critical errors from the printer. Um, in 1535, we, uh, a final agent by the name of Henry Phillips was sent to England, or, I mean to um, uh, Europe, to search for Tyndall. Phillips arrived in Antwerp making friends among the different merchants under the facade as a fellow Lutheran. Ponce was very wary and untrusting um, of his interactions with Philip and um, denied any knowing of Tyndall every time he'd ask. Uh, Tyndall did end up meeting him in town one day um, and fell for Henry's uh, act of Lutheranism and love for Tyndall's work. Uh, after Tyndall's trust was gained, William vouched for the man with the Ponce family, inviting him over to dinner at their house many times. Uh, Phillips, um, though remaining careful, it was too late before Thomas realized the trap Philip was uh, preparing. Um, Philip did realize quickly that uh, Tyndall had eyes and ears all over Antwerp protecting him and that his job of getting Tyndall out of the city would become much more difficult than uh, he first believed. Um, after, um, in the May of 1535, Phillips invited William to lunch. After they left the Ponce home, the two men entered their destination. Tyndall walking in first found two officers waiting to bind him. They snuck him out of Antwerp and took him to the castle of Vildor, six miles outside of Brussels, and it was here they threw Tyndall into the foulest smelling, dampest dungeon they had, with nothing as company but mostly darkness and scurrying rats. It was here that Tyndall realized that he had finished his course. Ponce tried diligently to see the release of his friend, riding and flooding the halls of Vildor and Henry VIII with letters from different merchants pleading for his release, but it was of no use. Ponce was ultimately interrogated for treason, charged five shillings a day to have the honor of two guards stationed outside his home at all times, lost his merchant business, and banished from the Low Countries. He was separated from his wife and family for many years and died a poor man in the year 1562. Meanwhile, Tyndall was in his dungeon and knew the fate coming to him. He thought there might be a trial, but he knew it would only be a formality. He looked at it as a way to speak the gospel before the courts. So he diligently began his defense. While in prison, Tyndall was forced to also pay for his guards, and by many accounts, his prison stay was believed to be a year and 135 days. The reason this was longer was because um, uh, the church at this time had spent a lot of time translating uh, his different works into languages they could understand. Um, though he spent many cold nights and had very little light, Tyndall never wasted an opportunity to prepare, prepare his defense and always stayed busy. He also had many visitors, and most of them were not friends of the gospel. We do know that Tyndall had a great influence in the castle, however, through his testimony. In fact, according to Fox, uh, Tyndall's keeper, the keeper's daughter, and others in the household came to know Christ through him. Others in the castle said that Tyndall, um, by his testimony, that if he was not a Christian, then there was no such thing. When his trial was finally arrived, charges were brought. There was a whole list of charges, but his greatest offenses were, one, he maintained that faith alone justifies, Two, he maintained that to believe in the forgiveness of sins and to embrace the mercy offered in the gospel was enough for salvation. Three, he denied purgatory. Four, he denied the freedom of the will. Five, he affirmed that neither the virgin nor the saints pray for us in their own person. And six, that neither the virgin or the saints should be invoked by us. In 1536 of August, uh, they condemned him as a heretic, stripped him publicly of his uh, priestly position imprisoned for two more months where they, he had many visiting priests, monks, and friars all trying to get him to recant so that they could be the great man to right wrong as the one to break Tyndall. But this would not be the case for this great reformer. In October, Tyndall was led outside where um, the castle before a crowd. 
The prisoner was brought uh, for one last appeal to recant. Tyndall stood there immovable among the crowd and uh, watched as his cruel judges mercilessly stared at him, no doubt pitying them. He felt pity as he gazed towards the common people and uh, pity for their ignorance. As silence fell among the crowd, they watched the tired, thin prisoner lean forward and with an impassionate prayer that echoed all over the land, or, uh, declared, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Tyndall was taken to the stake and with an iron chain put it on his throat and a hemp noose around his neck, the executioner snapped his neck, killing him within seconds. The attorneys lit the brushwood around him and the commoners watched in amazement at the patient sufferance of Master Tyndall. In the year of his death, Two Bibles began circulating England, one from the hands of Miles Coverdale, another from um, called the Matthews Bible that was a man by the name of John Rogers who was a convert in the English house of Antwerp where Tyndall was staying. Both contained Tyndall's New Testament and both heavily used um, his uh, Pentateuch and books of the Old Testament to translate uh, the Hebrew. Seeking the king's approval of the work, the Coverdale Bible in which Tyndall's name was not mentioned uh, was per presented to Henry. He had his bishops study the work thoroughly, and they reported to find no heresy in it. Henry then roared, then if there be no heresies, in God's name let it go among the peoples. Henry ordered every church in England to display one copy of the Bible. The people were urged to learn the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments in English, the crime that the poor people of Coventry were killed for in 1519. The Lord answered Tyndall's dying prayer. England had its Bible, and God in his province was preparing um, to release the, um, was preparing a brilliant young academic in Basel, Switzerland to carry on the Reformation. Uh, in the same year, 1536, John Calvin was preparing to release his Institutes of Christian Religion. And um, as one gospel torch was being put out, God saw to it that another one was lit. The result of his work um, that started nearly 500 years ago not only gave England her greatest treasure, but has given millions of even English speaking people throughout the years God's sacred word. So, I want to end this uh, study with a couple of thoughts. One, we should thank God every day for what he did through Tyndall and men like him for bringing us um, from the darkness that would surround us without God's light and his word given to us. Two, we should not take the scriptures for granted. There was a huge price paid to get this um, book in our hands and we would be wise to honor the man and more importantly God by protecting and learning the scripture that he gave his life to give us. It is really eye-opening the level of importance that men like Tyndall have for scripture versus the view we see today. Three, we should think about the critiques that Tyndall had concerning the universities of his day. Remember that they spent a lot of time studying heathen philosophies rather than scriptures. We should look to Tyndall's model, which is the biblical model. We should make sure we ourselves and our children are taught and grounded in scriptures first and foremost. Um, <clears throat> Our church leaders should be raised and prepared by grounding themselves in scriptures rather than worrying what conservative uh, university, seminary, or uh, <clears throat> Christian school that our children and uh, leaders attend. The modern church in America is in its condition because we have turned our backs on the authority of scriptures and focus on the vain philosophies of men. And finally, we should look at Tyndall's example by not letting our external circumstances dictate our reaction. This man lived out a life just as Paul, even in his, um, as he knew his end was coming. He spent his time, rather than fretting over how he would die, uh, evangelizing everyone he came in contact to with in his prison. He was continuing about the business of leading others to Christ, and we would be wise to model our lives in the same manner, as he was truly an ambassador of Christ, and loved not his life, even unto death.